let's be fair. Yeah, <laughs> it's on. <laughs> okay. So the goal here is to present a use case um, based on uh, the conference of yesterday on Qbot on how to find uh, devices which have a upl.php file exposed. Uh, Onif, my company, is doing internet scanning, uh, 200 ports, uh, ports scan monthly, and we also scan URLs, and you will see this is really the interesting part here. We scan uh, 300 million URLs per month, and growing, and we do tagging and classification, or classification of device, devices. Uh, the detection here is based on finding open web directories and being able, of course, to, to, to find uh, file names exposed. Uh, if we do a search for the last seven months of data, because we store seven months of data, uh, there is more than 11,000 devices which have a upl.php file exposed. Um, you can query it from the command line. There is an open source tool for that with a Splunk-like syntax. And the idea here is to find the number of unique host names which are exposing upl.php file. So let's show the demo. OK. Autorisé. Hop. OK. So the command line is, is running. And it will just spit out the, num the, the name of the unique host names which are exposed with uh, a upl.php file. Uh, in fact, it will spit out for two minutes, so I, I will have to, to, to cut it at some point because I don't have two minutes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's the, the idea here. In the end, it's uh, more than 10,000 unique host names with this query. Uh, so the next question is, how many of them are compromised? Well, having a upl.php is already a bad, si a bad sign, of course. Uh, with a Splunk-like syntax, we can do correlation. Uh, we extract, in fact, the list of IP addresses hosting the file. We deduce the IP address, and we run a second search, adding the tag compromised, stating the device has been compromised. And again, we, we search the unique number of host names. In the end, it's uh, more than 1,600 uh, uh, unique host names which have been found. Uh, but well, we could, should consider all of them as compromised. How do we detect? Simple pattern matching in HTML content and some other heuristics. For example, just one IP address. Uh, and you see it has been hacked by Bomber Cyber Army Indo Sec. Well, this is a compromised device. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. And the video is still running. Can you stop? Okay, Tom. Okay. Well, hi, everybody. Um, sorry, I couldn't come up with a better title, so I stole this tweet from uh, 2015 after my lightning talk that I gave. Uh, so I just took that as a title. Um, this is my who, my who Am I slide. So for those who maybe attend their first, the first BotConf here, who haven't seen me speaking. Um, actually, I need to update that slide pretty soon because uh, in a couple months I'll be working for Swiss Post for uh, 15 years. And uh, why am I still working at Swiss Post? Because as you can see on the slide, I can pretty much do what I like to do and what I enjoy doing. And another reason is because I can attend every BotConf. I've been to every BotConf and I can talk about whatever I like, whatever I want to share. So for the first couple of editions, I've been talking about Ponma Cup, malware, botnet. Uh, uh, I've been talking about Sysmon for a few years and uh, giving a few lightning talks in between. And then the last year, I was talking about desktop group. And this is actually a slide from the latest uh, desktop group presentation. So basically, it's showing a pattern I talk uh, a couple botcoms about the topic, and then like two, three years later, some 
cool company comes out with a report and like, wow, they have so much more insight and they can show so much more what's going on behind the scenes that I didn't get access or I didn't have the data for anything. So uh, earlier this year, I finally got around to uh, put out a blog post, um, basically just linking everything uh, pu publicly available about desktop group and also linking a, a, a link to my uh, invitation Google group for collaboration. Uh, here a little bit bigger. So basically um, in 2018, about over four years ago, we started tracking desktop group at Swiss Post. In 2019, the first BotConf talk. In 2020, uh, I was giving an online talk at Reversing. And in 2021, uh, Group IB and Orange Cert prepared a really great thread report, but unfortunately it cannot be published yet. So I'm waiting for that. And then earlier this year, Swift added Desktop Group as an alias to a thread actor that they track and publish. So um, as you see uh, the pattern, I'm talking about Desktop Group for a couple of years and then a really great report gets written, but it's not published yet. So I'm really waiting that it comes out and uh, it will be quite, quite good. And actually one of the later uh, lightning talks will talk about a different topic about that subgroup. So looking forward to that, do you go? Time's up. And that's it. Thank you. Oh, good timing. Interesting. C'est là-bas, pas là. C'est pour ça à cause de ça. Ok. Hey everyone, um, my name is Ivan, I work for Kaspersky, and uh, this presentation is obviously supported 100% by my employer, and everything I say represents their position on the subject. <laughs> so, one thing I've been doing for a while is uh, every time I see promoted content on Twitter, I would block the person that, uh, the account from which this content originates from. This is just because I don't like advertising, uh, like every normal person. And in 2018, I actually shared my block list on Twitter, um, and I expected people would uh, share their own as well and would merge them and get like a Twitter free, uh, an advertising free Twitter environment. So I didn't never get any PR, any pull requests, but some people used it, which was pretty cool. Um, and uh, yeah, I kind of forgot about it until recently. Um, uh, a conversation on Twitter showed to me that a number of people were doing the same, and it kind of reignited my interest in crowdsourcing the global destruction of uh, you know, advertisers on Twitter and henceforth bringing the destruction of Twitter's business model. The issue is, uh, since the new design that was released, uh, I think probably around 2019 or 2020, the feature that allowed you to export block lists in CSV or import them was actually removed, which kind of makes sense because Twitter really, really doesn't want us doing this. Uh, so where is the feature to export block lists? Not there anymore. And if you deep dive, dive deep enough in the, uh, the documentation, you will find that you know, they admit that they kind of took this away, and now if you want to do the same thing, then what you should do is do a GDPR request, get your data, and then you will find it uh, somewhere else. So I was like, okay, fine. Let's JDPR. Um, so it turns out that, yeah, you do get your block list that way. It's in a JSON format. It's kind of uh, weird to parse, but you can do it. But also looking at the data, it also turns out that you have a file called personalization.js where you get this very interesting list. Like it's about a list of 750 accounts, for me at least, uh, that 
are like accounts that Twitter thinks I might be interested in seeing promoted content from. So I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Maybe I should just block them preemptively, right? <laughs> so what I did, uh, since of course we cannot import block lists anymore, we can only export them or get access to them, what I did is I created a Twitter script uh, that allows you to export and import block lists using the Twitter API. And my suggestion is that you kind of use it. You'll need to get the API keys, but it's kind of doable. Um, you do this, send me a PR, you import my uh, block list to your account, and then you know everyone lives happily ever after. Uh, but it could actually be better, and what I'm talking about is what I would like to do is actually create a web app because getting keys is a bit annoying. So you just go to a web page, click uh, login with Twitter, and then I would steal your block list. You would get mine for free. I would merge them manually. And uh, yeah, every time there's an update, you would get it. And, oh, and what, the reason why I'm not going to do it right now is that I think this is what's going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe he'll get some time for the demo, if he's nice. Uh, you, Do you want the email too? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I haven't got yours. Okay, so we're moving to number five, and I'll, I'll get yours just after. There you go. Yay. Hello, everyone. So I'm Remy from the Cert Michelin. And today, um, I'm just disconnected, like every other French, about VT. So let's find out why. So uh, I'm a developer. So uh, the standard application free tier model is very simple. You have view controller model. And then uh, you have the client that requests the app. And then you have the DBA request. So uh, you have the HTTP call, then the controller, then the API, more DB stuff, and it gets back uh, the JSON or YAML file and converts it to HTML. Then why do we have some quota for the request API and it's not available in the web GUI? Because you talk to the controller and it's supposed to go to the API. So. Um, no, what, what do I have to do? So uh, I could clone the uh, web GUI and make the controller myself uh, using the API, or maybe someone in the assembly have something like that. So if you are interested to contribute or you have it, uh, please contact me. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to download an email. Just a second. Austin. Should we care about formula injection? Is that steroids or? There you go. Timer. Yeah. All right, hello everyone. My name is Austin Tursik. Um, so while I'm not doing stuff with info stealers and malwares, I do a lot with web, app web application bug hunting. So this brings up the question, should we actually care about formula injections? Before we actually talk about whether or not we should care, let's talk about what it is. Um, according to OWASP, it's a CSV injection, and it occurs when a website embeds untrusted input into CSV files. Now, this doesn't bother much for a CSV file, but when it opened in Excel or whatnot, 
it can be a problem. So let's talk about what are some of the potential impacts. First off, we have data exfiltration. Given that we can put in formulas, we can easily start pulling out data. Worst case scenario, however, comes to things like data manipulation and remote code execution. We can leverage public, ex uh, public uh, exploits as well as in Windows environments, dynamic data exchanges. What's even worse, we can also manipulate data. A lot of CSV files are used as a uh, as uh, logging in some situations, and when opened in the wrong tools, that can be problematic. So, should we care about these? Yes. I'm not just saying this as somebody who's lost a lot of money in bug bounty programs because these weren't considered valid. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the excuses I've seen in the past and why I, th I don't think they're that good. Um, I really see this as an Excel flaw, feels like a cheap cop-out, because I feel like an XSS that only affects Internet Explorer, my Mozilla Firefox, is just as much of an issue, but developers don't see feel bad about, about fixing those. Essentially, uh, another one, uh, this is effectively something that can be duplicated by emailing someone a malicious CSV. Again, very true. Uh, big difference here, though, is that they're using an application they can trust. Imagine if every time they opened a tool that they use every day, it just downloaded malware. None of us Windows users know what that's like. Um, following that, clients reading a CSV and interpreting the content as commands are misinterpreting the file format. I absolutely agree. Uh, CSV files should just be a flat text file. Unfortunately, Microsoft, Apple, and some versions of Linux have decided that whenever we want to open up a CSV file, we get to use their fun Libre tool or we get to use Microsoft uh, Office. And we have to make a lot of changes if we don't want to. And finally, any mitigation on our back end would, would have a limited effectiveness and would force us to modify the data. This would break the workflow for users manipulating the CSV files with safe software. This is one I got recently. Um, and again, I stand that in any other situation, you don't really, we wouldn't really care about breaking the workflow. I've never met an admin who was unwilling to update a cross-site scripting or an SQL injection simply because it would break the workflow. Um, so. I wouldn't get up here and say that we should uh, actually do something about these without talking about the mitigations. Easiest way is remove those first characters. Um, we can also look at OWASP's uh, recommendations for more thorough. And if you're not going to fix it, at least tell your uh, users that there's a potential vulnerability that could allow them to uh, that could allow threat actors to install malware through their um, trusted applications. So with the last six seconds, you have questions, comments, concerns, you're a developer who wants to yell at me because you're now going to get these vulnerabilities, feel free to message me on any of these things. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now we're back to number six. Six, because it's max, it's max, okay. Almost. Hey, dogs on the beamer. No. It's this thing, this stupid. Better. You got it? It works. Got it. Thank you. Well, that should be the beacon for this evening. I figured third time on stage would uh, give me access to Eric's computer. <laughs> Thank you. So I wanted to talk about my binary analysis course. Uh, first question is obviously, what is it? Uh, it's a public and free course uh, that I wrote over the past roughly four years. Uh, I've been iteratively updating it with uh, blog posts, and it should provide you with conceptual insights uh, with the help of practical cases. Uh, I think the cases that were showcased the past days during BotConf are great for learning as well, uh, but obviously some steps are skipped and not everything is written out in full, uh, whereas everything is written out in full here. So. If you're interested in reverse engineering, automating uh, some stuff, then you can check this out. Uh, it has background information, conceptual explanations, has practical cases to keep you somewhat entertained, I hope. Uh, there's malware analysis, automation scripts, and some tips to write reports, because at the end of the day, you need to report what you're writing on. Um, a few excerpts. I wrote a script, uh, well, multiple ones, 
Uh, my latest one is regarding stack strings and how to deal with them in Jira. Um, it's based on an existing one, and I rewrote this uh, and improved it. Uh, then I have an example from the XOR uh, DDoS tool, uh, which I think somebody presented about today as well, or at least mentioned, um, where I decrypt the array uh, that they use with strings. Do note the Java extensions at the end, as I'll return to that. Uh, and then there's the uh, Amade Stealer, where there is a automated uh, string decryption, uh, where you get the comments in the overview as well from Jira. Where on the left-hand side, you have the original, and the right-hand side is both running the script. So for those wondering where might you find it, uh, it's on my website. It's available uh, for well, anyone. There are no ads or blogs or anything. Uh, if you have any questions, suggestions, or simply want to state how much you dislike Java, whereas I like it, uh, you can reach out to me, Twitter, LinkedIn, or Telegram, or shout to me at the gala. Uh, shoot, anything should work. Thank you. Thank you. Version two. He did two versions of a, of a lightning talk. Great. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Igor Riffle. I work for Orange Cyber Defense. It's a computer emergency response team. And I'm currently mainly focused on uh, threat intelligence, but I formerly did some incident treatments also for this company. So what I want to talk uh, this evening is about uh, three samples that were observed in one of our engagement, and they were related to this uh, desktop group uh, intrusion set that Tom talked about a little bit earlier. So I just want to share some detail with you. So they were, uh, they use, they mainly use a lot of uh, this packer, I mean, it's a packer uh, made with auto it to drop some file like nanocore rat or to drop some meterpreter. And what you can see there is that they try to mimic some kind of VLC or Java application. And they, yes, you can see that when you uncompress, uh, because it's uh, basically, sorry, um, a compressed file, you can see that there is uh, more than 100 megabyte file outside, even if the origin file is about two megabytes. So uh, how they did that, it's just that they put in the auto it script some uh, garbage block of comments and they repeated it more than 400 types. So it's quite simple, uh, but it's quite effective. In fact, it means that for some sandbox or endpoint security products, they just uh, forbid to analyze two big files. So it's just a, yes, a big picture how the packer works. So it's something very basic, I mean they are just uh, extract file, uh, run legit auto it interpreter, they have some encrypted payload, they have scheduled tasks for persistence, and they copy a reg SVCS because the packer is designed to load uh, .NET assembly. So uh, the last part of, the, of this lighting talk is about the encryption key because they copied some com from Yes, GitHub, as all malware devs do and all devs do. And but what they did is, I guess they build a kind of builder and they uh, push an encryption key in UTF-16. And but what they failed to do is that they keep the STR parameter in the call to DLL call instead of using WSTR for wide string. So what happened is that with the original uh, binary key, we 30 bytes of UTF-16, using this uh, parameter, it means that it extracts all those 30 NC char, but in fact, over 30 bytes key, you have 29 bytes are just useless because they are all replaced by a question mark, which is 3F, in fact. So, um, I, you have uh, malware ashes. Uh, feel free to ask some of the sample are on um, virus total, and I will be very interested if some of you have already encountered such kind of packer. So, thanks to all of you. Thank you. Right on time. Show the PDF. Hi everyone, um, so I'm here to present to you uh, my school last year project. So my name is Tom. Um, so 
quick disclaimer, everything that you're going to see is basically a lesser version of uh, third Polska tools. Uh, basically homemade version because we like to do it our way and still I think it can be interesting to see like the way we do it. So quite a complicated um, thing to just tell that so botnet tracker is a software something that we want to do to um, make an in-between um, between long-term sandboxing and actual like just occasional uh, C2 uh, polling. So we want to follow a C2, we want to get as IOCs, and the idea is that we can just um, use botnet tracker. So quick idea. So you're the users, um, there's like a master uh, computer, which is, well, we named it uh, Asgard, which is a Django application. Um, and you want to actually, well, have some bots exchanging with the C2 panels on the right side. So the C2 have obviously some uh, infected machine that they control, and you're just going to reverse the script once, uh, well, reverse the malware once, and then uh, emulate it with a Python script, and then just exchange it, exchange with the C2 panel to get the lastest uh, IOCs and, well, updates, possibly. So, well, what do we actually have? So we have uh, 10 fully implemented bots. Um, well, I'm going to show you right after. Two silent bots, uh, meaning that we, uh, they can't actually be, they, are, they aren't listed in the panel interface uh, as we exploited the um, panel uh, protocol. Uh, we have three remote configuration extractor, like just getting all the info from the malware panel. One utility library uh, you, being used for, to like decompre decompress data or compress it or do some hashes. So basically, Malduck, uh, but like homemade. And like we worked uh, so as a school project only on uh, 13 panel sources. Here are an excerpt of uh, the like three months of work: uh, Redline, LuckyBot, Amadei, etc. I don't have much time. I uh, didn't hesitate to come. Uh, to talk about this after talk. So our main uh, problems and how we dealt with, that, with them or not. Uh, so we wanted to have some panels to exchange with to test our product. Uh, so we actually did like some sort of um, panel tracker based on public feed and web scraping. Um, some bots were really hard to implement, but we did it quite realistically, doing screenshot and everything. And so, well, malware, everything, not we, we couldn't follow everything that we wanted. Anyway, so we have quite loads of ambition and want to go on with this project. And it's going to be open source quite soon, we hope. So do not hesitate to come if you are interested or want to work with it. And lastly, before finishing and giving up on this, um, we're organizing a You're CTF finished. <laughs> based on malware analysis. So soon come and sponsor if you want to. Thanks. So he actually hacked my uh, lineup. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Konstantin from Proofpoint. I'm in threat research and I do DDX or we are doing DDX, which stands for Detection, Detonation, and Config Extraction. And I want to explain quickly what this is to you. So um, email is still number one entry point for actors. We see URLs, we see attachments, we see also malware scams, which yeah, lead to customers bleeding. So um, on the slide, you can see a exemplary attack chain. You have an email that leads to a PDF which has a bit.ly URL in it, which redirects to a file sharing site, which downloads a password-protected RAR archive. In this case, the password is in the PDF, but it could also be in the um, email. And uh, in the end, it leads to Bandook malware installed on the host. So you have complex attack chains with multiple steps until the actual malware is dropped. And those are hard to automate, but not impossible. So I hope you are familiar with the concept of the pyramid of pain. If not, I don't have the time to explain it. 
but it would be best to have a detection in place for the green part, which is um, the malware, and blue is the detection. So like, it would be best to detect Bandook malware and extract the config. But because the detonation, which is the red part um, of the full attack chain, is really hard to automate and it can break in multiple steps, it's also good to have detection in place for the other pieces. So for uh, the bit.ly URL redirecting to the password protected RAR, for the PDF, and also um, for the email, of course. So um, those are lower in the pyramid of pain, but um, yeah, also useful for us. If we look more into detail, you will see that, yeah, there are elements in the email that you can flag. There are elements in the PDF that you can flag. And of course, you can extract the configuration uh, from the Bandook malware, which you have classified before. Um, so two points to remember here. Uh, first is that not always uh, the best, uh, the highest detection at the pyramid of pain is the best. You also need lower detection. And the second point is that, yeah, um, such an attack chain, it's only an example, of course, is hard to detonate until the end. So if something breaks in the detonation, it's also good to have detection in place in previous stages. Okay, bonus slide. Um, if you have the config extracted from the final malware, you can also uh, create network signatures, of course. As you have seen, we also extracted the um, encryption key, the AES information, so we were also able to decrypt the network traffic. And yeah, if a sample is free, uh, in OSINT data, then it goes into ETOpen, which is free, and you can every, everyone can use it. Thanks. Thank you. OK, let's talk. He's not here. Frédéric. Hello everyone, I'm Fred, I'm part of the, the organizing uh, committee and uh, previously in charge of uh, the recordings. So I'm here to... Previously, answer, yeah. Yeah, previously. <laughs> I'm here to answer uh, Martin's uh, question, so where's my 2019 video? So in fact, I have all the videos, all the recordings, but we had some issue with uh, our cheap life pack to record, to stream, and so on. Uh, so finally, we had this setup, <clears throat> but we had some issue. So mainly with a USB uh, bandwidth uh, issue, some uh, CPU uh, uh, burning, and so on. And now we have a new solution, thanks to Paul, but I think he's no longer here. So it's working a lot now. And finally, just to answer to Martin, uh, maybe in 2023, we'll have your video uploaded online. Thanks. Maybe. <laughs> Yvon, you want to do your demo? demo? Allez. Allez. Oh. So, so I, I can group the jury to decide who gets the gift. Okay, so basically, uh, this is the file personalization.js I was mentioning earlier, and what I did is I just extracted all the accounts and put them into a TXT file. Now the issue is Twitter's API will not let you block accounts by handle, but instead you need to have an account idea. So this is a bit of scripting we have to do right there. So I created this uh, block and roll script here, and uh, in order to use it, you will need to have a, a few keys. Now, don't bother copying those because I'm going to revoke them the second I get off the stage. Um, so these ones, uh, you can create them when um, you log into the Twitter developer dashboard. So just create an app there, create, copy the tokens. And then the first time you run the script, then you will get an, um, an invite, I would say, where 
like I'm going to do I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it like this. So I have this uh, generate option, which takes a list of handles and creates a CSV file that you can import. And since here my app is not authorized, then you, when you launch the script for the first time, then you get to copy the, um, this URL. Uh, you need to go online, like do something like this. You authorize the app, and then you copy a pin code. And this is the only time that you have to do this. Uh, hopefully, this th this is the most streamlined I was able to to do for this process, unfortunately. But uh, hopefully, in the future, this can be improved. Uh, and then you just copy those parameters and put them in the script. And then you're you're set forever. So let me just replace this like that. Okay. And meanwhile, uh, if you go back to the, the list, uh, if I go to my uh, output file, which was test.csv, then you would get a file like this that actually contains the proper CSV file in the former format that Twitter uh, actually accepts. And then you have another option, which, uh, let me remove the file. The other option would be to export a block list, and the way you would do this is minus E or minus minus dash export. Um, And then normally, yeah, a super annoying program, never buy it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So here I export my block list and then again, uh, you would get uh, everything like the way you expect. And now the final thing would be you just have the final uh, flag, which would be a minus I or dash dash import, uh, which you would point to this new CSV file that you created and then it would import the block list. Now, I'm not going to do this on, on stage because Twitter's API is quite restrictive when it comes to importing blocks. Uh, you can only get, them, get 50 of them per 15 minutes, uh, which is a bit annoying, to be honest, but at the same time, it's like you don't really need those accounts to be blocked right now, so you can just launch the script, come back tomorrow, and have everything blocked. So again, everything, everything is on GitHub, including my own block list, so feel free to check it out and uh, submit your own. Thank you very much for the extra time. <laughs> Thank you.